I was brought up on a, um, a dairy farm in Northland, about an hour and a half north of Auckland, our biggest city. And uh, as a child, I spent a lot of time working and playing in that environment. And it was quite a special environment. Um, a lot of bush, some really nice streams. Um, quite small farms at those times and lots of other uh, families living in the valley that we lived in. And as I got older, I went to university, um, came back to the farm sometime later on and uh, managed the farm myself. But really noticed the, the difference between um, <clears throat> the way the farm was when I was a child and when I came back later on. A lot smaller, a lot, lot less people in the, in the community then, in that valley. Um, all the farms had got bigger. A lot of the environment that had been so special to me as a child was, had been cut down or removed. Um, also, I went through university at a time when there was a lot of challenges to the way things were happening and new ideas presented to us, um, what we call the, the Vietnam War period. And I got introduced to a lot of ideas, a lot of political ideas, a lot of ecological ideas that uh, I really enjoyed learning about and felt quite passionate about really. Started to think about how I could bring those ideas back to the farm. <clears throat> and for me, I was um, really aware that, that um, the ecology of the farm was changing and there was that challenge that sat in front of us around how do we create different ecologies and uh, the minute I bumped into permaculture the, the whole idea resonated with me. Here was a way that we could address the changes that I could see happening in, in my environment and um, do some really positive stuff in the world. So my, my uh, introduction to the eco-village movement um, was understanding that the farm that we had was essentially dedicated to one product and, and that was sending sheep over to Europe. And in my, in my studies on ecology, I could see the potential for a lot more things to happen there. And and uh, using the permaculture ideas, but that involved having more people there. Um, if all, all we're gonna do is concentrate on one product, then usually all we need is one family farming the land and that's all we need. But if we're gonna get into different ideas, different products, different uh, scenarios, then um, we need to find a way of having more people on the land. And the model we have now um, it's quite difficult to have more people on the land. Usually one person owns it, um, if you're a farmer, and um, they're dedicated to maximising the profit on that particular product. So the eco-village idea that was introduced to me through the permaculture movement really appealed to me in, in terms of, um, I guess my main, main aim was how do we look after the land, how do we um, essentially make a polyculture out of, out of this environment that we want to live in rather than a monoculture. So the eco-village felt like a real key um, as to how we would do that. <clears throat> and at the time, it was like um, in the 70s and there was the Back to the Land movement which was prominent here in New Zealand for a few people just as the same it was in Australia and in the, in the States. And um, a lot of the ideas then revolved around um, doing things more communally and we went through that, that stage just like a lot of other people did and found that that didn't, partic didn't work particularly well. Um, the eco-village movement was a progression on, on, on that in a way in that it got a lot clearer about having individual title or individual tenure to, to part and as well as that having um, um, essentially 
having the commons back again so that the whole community would have some say in, in how the, the bulk of the land was used. And that, that gives the possibility of uh, multiple land use and integrated land use, which is sort of key things that, that sit within the permaculture concept. So I was really attracted to the permaculture movement and, and the eco-village movement. So that's been a major part of my life for the last 30 years. And uh, we developed a, a, um, a small eco-village um, on the family farm. <coughs> And there were some parts of that worked really well and, and some that didn't. And so now I'm in the process of looking at a larger piece of land. So we've got more potential to, to do what I envisage. And starting again in some ways in terms of the, the legal structures and the social structures that we construct within the eco-village. So we're in the process of developing Kotari Village here now. It's in the northern Hawke's Bay. Um, the, the main differences from the last eco-village that uh, we were involved with, um, which was called Kohatu Tor Eco-Village. In uh, Kohatu Tor Eco-Village, um, it was a smaller block of land. There, there wasn't um, the potential to have a large number of families on it and the economies of scale in some ways were lacking. So that was one issue that we had. Um, another major issue that we had was that it was quite close to a major city and over time what we could see was the influences of that culture were, were dominating what happened on that eco-village. So we felt drawn to move away from the major city. and. Um, perhaps one of the most, uh, the, perhaps one of the major things was um, we developed a culture of consensus decision making within the Kuhatu Tō village, and we found that that was really restrictive. That we tended to um, either not make decisions or make decisions based on the lowest common denominator. And while we had autonomy in terms of our individual house sites, um, we ended up not really having a well-managed commons because of the consensus decision-making process. So that was a major challenge for me to think about why that was so, what we could do about it. So the, um, we, we set about looking for a new place to set up a village and it took us several years to do. Uh, we wanted to find a place that was relatively isolated, wasn't affected by industrial horticulture, um, had the resources that we needed, so plenty of good soil, plenty of good water. And we found this beautiful spot here, which we're really loving. We've been here for a year now. And over that last year, um, I've been in the process of setting up the legal structures and to a certain extent some of the social structures that um, will help this village grow. So that's, that's been a really exciting and, and challenging project to do. So initially, um, our, our main goals in terms of those legal and social structures is that each individual that comes here has um, their own individual tenure for their house allotment. That essentially what they do and their house allotment is up to them, that they have an option of um, either being self-employed or being employed in a cooperative that is owned by the community here. So we don't necessarily see that people need to um, work communally or live communally. It's really like a, a traditional village um, but we're also aware that we want the community to have a large say as to how the land is used and how we develop. So what we've done is we've set up a, a trust that owns the land and the trustees um, who direct that, that, um, that land, how it's used and how it's developed, they're all um, voted on by 
the, by the members of the community. But essentially they have a, a legal um, structure and a leadership structure that enables them to essentially use the wisdom that they have to make the decisions for the whole community. They still, um, they still consult with the community, but it's not the whole community that makes the decision. We also have a, um, a, a legal structure which is essentially a membership-based uh, structure so that those people who are part of the community is defined by that membership. So that's an incorporated society and um, they make decisions just like any other incorporated society. They have a, an annual general meeting, they, they appoint a committee, uh, that committee makes the decisions for the common land. So that's things like tracks and paths and village greens and community spaces and things like that. So, and they're, they're in a position where they consult with the whole membership. Um, the membership can call special um, general meetings anytime they like to, to challenge any of the decisions of the committee. So essentially we have a, um, two separate governance systems. Um, one, well we have three actually, three, three separate governance systems. The, the first one is that, that you on your own individual um, house lot, you, you decide what you do there, that's your choice. Um, there's a few there's a few, few rules to the lease which cover environmental issues, but by and large you choose what you do there. The second governance or the main governance structure is for the ownership of the land and that's held by a trust. And then the other governance structure is is for the membership of the community and the management of the common land. And then within those three governance, um, structures, if anyone wants to use um, any parts of the balance of the land, they go to the trust and put forward a proposal as to how they would use it. And, and that proposal could come forward from individuals or it could come forward from a cooperative because we'll, we will set up a cooperative here as well. And those decisions are based on essentially the wisdom of the trustees and their consultation with the whole membership. So if someone wants to set up a dairy farm here, um, that could be run as a, a share farming operation with an individual or it could be run by a cooperative, but it won't be run by the, um, either by the trust or by the incorporated society. So in, in essence the the governance and the direction of the land use is done by a trust, but those people um, who are making the management decisions around land are either individuals or separate cooperatives. So we've, we've separated the, the governance of the ownership of the land and the governance of the management of the land. And, and in doing so we've, we've um, it feels for me like we we're able to avoid a lot of the problems that are associated with communal management and with consensus decision making. So we're in a transitional phase now. Um, we're anticipating having 30 or so families here. Um, at the moment, we've got half a dozen families and a couple of individuals. The transitional phase is that at the moment, um, the land is owned by a private company. It's essentially a development company. Um, that development company has committed to a certain program. And as soon as it's paid for the land, then that land gets passed over to the trust, which is that's the community land trust. In the meantime, the, the um, a company has essentially said, okay, this is our program for the next two years. Um, a major part of that program is, is getting uh, more people in who are essentially investing in, in the trust, um, getting investors in, um, setting up the camp so people can come here, developing the roads, things like that. So we're in a development phase for at least the next two years. And in that, 
in, in that process, um, as people come in, the land will get paid for, um, the, the development will start getting done, and then, then the development company essentially done its job and it can get out of the way. Um, we anticipate that that will probably happen when we've got half of those 15 people that are, or families that are coming in once the land's paid for and that's probably going to take a couple of years to do. Um, the, the company is about to set up a uh, cooperative and that cooperative will be partly owned by the trust and partly owned by the people who are working in it. So that's going to be an interesting model to work out. Um, I particularly like the Mondragon cooperative model. Um, we're just working through how that might work at the moment. But essentially what the cooperative will do will be any work that the company needs to do that will be done under contract to the cooperative rather than the, the development company itself doing the work. Um, it'll be done by the cooperative and then that cooperative will continue on as, as a basic economic unit within the whole village. And probably one of its major jobs um, will be to both design and build a lot of the housing. So individuals can are totally free to build their own houses and um, to a large extent their own design. Um, the building cooperative um, will enable us to um, get the equipment we need to use local resources and hopefully build some really beautiful low cost housing. So um, a major driver in this um, project has been our understanding that, um, that within the context of peak oil and peak all sorts of things and um, the political changes that, that are about to happen that for us as a family and for a lot of the other families this, this project becomes a, a bit of a lifeboat. Um, a place that we know where we can grow good healthy food, a place where um, we're not too worried about the, the social chaos that might be occurring in the, in the big cities. But at the same time we're also aware that uh, we're living in the, in the wider world, we, we don't want to become isolationist and um, we've also got to think about the economy that we, we build into, into this land. Um, because it's going to take a long time for us to become um, really self-reliant in, in this community. So a, a significant part of what we anticipate um, will be that we'll develop an education centre here, um, a place where we can train designers and those designers can do work outside, um, a place where we can share the skills that, that we're building up in our self-reliance and have people come in and, and um, be part of this experience. So that's, that's a major, and there's always going to be a, a mix between our um, relationship with the outside world and how we can share those skills and, and building up the strength and resilience of, of our self-reliance here both as individuals as, and as, as a community. So that's a major focus within, within our economy here is, is those two threads. Um, we're certainly really aware that things could change quite quickly and we'll be putting a lot of emphasis on knowing that um, we can be essentially to totally self-sufficient as a community in food and, um, and, and energy. So that's a major component of what we're wanting to do. But we're also wanting to reach out to the wider world and use our experience to support others who are going through similar experiences. We're, we're aware that, that uh, the world needs a few models now as to how we can do things differently and so that's one of the challenges for us is, is uh, not only to get it right for ourselves but to be able to take that model out to the rest of the world and support changes. 
and we've already um, made a lot of connections where people are thinking along similar lines and we're able to support each other and bringing those changes forward. Yeah, that's, that's a major question as, as to how do we choose people coming in here. And um, we're aware that you can live with people for a long time and still not to get to know them that well. Um, some communities have a policy where they maybe need to live there for a, six months or a year before they're totally accepted. Um, we're in a position where we don't feel that's realistic for us. and. We've tried to put our emphasis on developing structures which are resilient enough that they'll cope with whoever comes here. Um, we will certainly have some selection policy and, and that what we've tried to do is to make clear to people who we are, what we're doing, so that they, they've got an opportunity to really think hard about whether they actually want to be part of that process of who we are. So we put a lot of emphasis on um, letting people understand who we are and in the end we've got to make a choice and we'll do the best we can there's there's always there'll always be um, times when people come here and then they decide that they're not suited for it but and and they'll choose to leave um, and others will replace them so we've set in place a structure where um, we've got enough rules and, and enough um, developing a culture where we um, face issues around conflict resolution before they, before they happen and that's a major part of, of um, what we're trying to develop here. While we've got a, a policy of having an open door for who comes here, we're also putting a lot of energy into um, putting out who we want to come here as well. So we're identifying opportunities for people to come here and identifying what we would like to see happen here. So a large part of that is around the strengths that we already have, and that's our... our um, the work that the Kong Institute has been doing around heritage seeds and around nutrient dense food production and the, the permaculture skills that and design skills that we're building here. So we see that not only can those uh, that knowledge and those skills be used to build self-reliance into the community but they can be used to develop an education centre here. So a large part of what we'd be doing from here on in is saying to people out there, um, this is what we're doing. Um, we're really keen to attract these sort of skills. So we need, um, we need more designers. We, we, we need more educators. We need people who've got skills in engineering and appropriate technology. We need people who've got skills in business management and people um, management. So there's a whole wide range of skills and those people might be self-employed or contracted um, to different organisations or they might be working in the cooperative. Exactly who turns up is going to be an interesting mix but we, what, what, what we do know is, is that um, we're going to have a need for um, particularly skills in growing food, educating people and appropriate technology and management of businesses. So in, in our modern society, a lot of the legal structures that we have that, that um, control our businesses, um, the, essentially the, the purpose statement for those businesses is that they maximise the, um, the profit for shareholders. So in essence, that, that dominates our land use, it dominates um, the social structures that can evolve in, the, in those communities. With the Community Land Trust, the, the essential purpose statement is that it holds the balance between looking after the environment, looking after the community and looking after the individual. So it means that 
that land uses and and um, the development of the community is is not captured by profit making and it's not captured by outside interests. One of the things that I was aware of when we set up this um, the legal structure here is that land often gets captured by the dominant industrial paradigm. So for me as a farmer, um, earlier on in my life, the land got captured by the need to or the the need to export um, produce to to Europe, and so that tended to dominate how the how the land was used, and. And thinking through how we might address that issue and, and avoid that so that the land was essentially captured by the community and not outside interests. Um, one of the, the um, important steps for that was coming across the community land trust model, which essentially put the um, ownership and the development of the land into the hands of the community. So. That enables us to say when people want to come and use the land, which they can, it enables us to say, okay, what's the benefit to the whole community? What's the benefit to the ecology of our environment here? What's the benefit for the person who's, who's doing it as well? So it's like we're able to, um, the community land trust has the role of holding that balance as to benefit to the whole web that we have here, not just the individual. And so that's a major part of, of our structure is, is having the community land trust um, legal structure and the kaupapa for the, like the purpose statement of the, of the um, community land trust which guides it and which is elected by the whole community.